Hi all and welcome to Debunking the Density Myth. My name is Kapish Singla. I am the Communications and Events Associate here at Transit Center. For those of you who may be new to us, Transit Center is a foundation that works to improve transit in order to make cities more just and environmentally sustainable. We're proud to co-sponsor this event with Citizens Housing and Planning Council. CHPC is a research and education nonprofit that has helped public policy better meet the needs of New Yorkers for over 80 years. Before I hand it over to today's panelists, I have two quick announcements. One, this event will be closed captioned, and the way that you can access that is by pressing the blinking CC button at the bottom of your screen. Also located at the bottom of your screen is the Q&A box. We'll have some time for audience questions towards the end of today's program, and you're welcome to submit comments or questions through that box at any time during the program. Once again, welcome to anyone who has just logged on and joined us for debunking the density myth. We'll first hear from Transit Center's Executive Director, David Bragdon, who will introduce today's discussion and the rest of the panel. Thanks very much, Kapish, and welcome everybody. I'm David Bragdon, Executive Director of Transit Center. As Kapish said, we're a foundation. We're committed to making cities more just and sustainable through better tra public transit. And we're really excited to be teaming up today with Citizens Housing and Planning Council. We've got a lot of common interests with them, actually. Often issues that get described as housing challenges are in reality also transportation challenges or vice versa. Sometimes transportation works the other way as well. And the economics and availability of good high quality housing and affordable housing and transportation really influence each other quite a bit yet they're rarely planned comprehensively and together. They're both such important com interdependent components of urban life. So we're really happy to be working with them he uh, here today. And let me get us going here. Um, all right, yep, there we go. Um, so I'm just going to make a few introductory remarks with regard to our findings about transit and some of what's going on in the field. Then, then Jessica Katz from CHPC is going to share their very detailed research showing that population density is not a key determinant in the spread of COVID-19. And then Wei, Wayne Ho, who's president and CEO of the Chinese American Planning Council, will share his on-the-ground insights into the inequities in the housing market, in the housing stock, and built environment that has made some New Yorkers disproportionately vulnerable during the pandemic. Now, early in the pandemic, a narrative started to emerge that correlated viral spread of COVID with density and with urbanity generally. Now, for some folks, this may have, this simplification might, it might seem like common sense superficially that transmission requires people. So therefore places with lots of people would be subject to a lot of transmission. That seems like it makes sense. In fact, April 13th, Governor Cuomo at his press conference that he was doing every day, Governor Cuomo, who, who controls the MTA, by the way, he said, it's simple. It's about density. That's what he, he said. And others kind of made that observation. Now, others have also made that type of observation though in bad faith and have sort of used this opportunity to reinforce existing prejudices and in, 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 and, and views. Activists like Joel Kotkin, who for a long time has been a proponent of sprawl type development, or Randall O'Toole at the Cato Institute, which is heavily funded by the fossil fuel industry, they've both jumped out with, with studies and statements equating COVID with urban areas. Now, that's not just factually wrong, but as we now know, but it's also sinister. It's also, frankly, it's been deadly. That misunderstanding, whether just a, a misunderstanding or whether it's in bad faith, really has led to the death of people and a misdiagnosis of the problem. And it's rooted in very systemic, systemic problems in our society. And that's what we're going to talk about today. For example, last week, Vanity Fair reported that J Jared Kushner in the White House dismissed the needs for a national response to COVID-19. In the views of the national regime in power in Washington right now, it didn't really matter 
because it was people in cities who were dying, particularly cities that didn't vote for their regime. And let's just say it as well, it's been affecting black and brown people disproportionately. And that is also a consideration in that political calculation, I wanna say, unfortunately. Racism, anti-cosmopolitanism, anti anti-science, that has, those all have unfortunately long histories in this country. And that history is reflected in our current day as well. Well, now though, science actually knows better. Now with the virus is now raging, here we are in August, governor of New York said, talked about density in April. Now here we are in August and the virus is raging in rural Texas and small towns in Mississippi and Missouri. It's rolling across the farmland of Wisconsin. So our understanding now of COVID is much more sophisticated. And of course, the proof of that is that the Times is on it. That's right, the, the Times is on it. I'm not able to advance, unless you're seeing something I'm not. I'm trying to advance my screen here. This worked before when we practiced. Ah, there we go. The time, okay, time that again. The Times, the Times is on it. This is from last Sunday's New York Times. Actually on the front page, below, above the fold was the story about the virus charging across rural parts of the country. And below the fold was a very thorough and nuanced story about the actual experience of international cities in terms of COVID spread and the implications for New York. It mirrored a lot of what we have found in secondary research at Transit Center and some of what we've reported in a fact sheet I'll give you the link to in a few minutes. But issue, uh, examples such as Seoul, and this is on the downside, downslope of the pandemic. Seoul returning to about 70% of pre-pandemic ridership without having spread attributed to the operation of their metro system. In Taipei, 80% return of normal ridership without record of spread on the, on the, on the metro system, as well as epidemical, epidemiological studies in France and Tokyo that also showed there was not traceable outbreaks attributable to transit in France and Tokyo. So what that's telling us is that, in fact, transit is not a super spreader, but this is more nuanced because nor is transit somehow a magical refuge either. Transit exists in time and place. It exists in a public health context. It exists in a societal context. And you have to look at that whole picture, which is what we're trying to do here today. And in cases, in places where there is a government public health system and a collaborative, cooperative sort of society, clear leadership and clear messaging, such as in Taiwan or in a lot of Western Europe, then the transit can come back with minimizing the risks. Now, what are those societal or government types of conditions? Well, it means very timely and robust testing and tracing in the public health system, a strong public health system to begin with, science-based intellectually consistent leadership and messaging that's based in, in what ch the changing conditions are, and a society of cooperative people who wear masks, wash their hands, and where also that individuals are given signals by society that if they're feeling sick, they can take time off without jeopardizing their income. In those types of societies and places where transit, and transit is part of a society like that, the risks can be minimized. Well, now in other sorts of countries, in more developed countries, in the developing countries, such as Peru or the current state of the United States of America, unfortunately, where there's a lack of testing, there isn't meaningful tracing, where the public health system is actually weak, where the leadership is erratic and inconsistent in terms of the messaging and where 30% of the population thinks that masks are for sissies and that the world is flat and that Bill and Hillary Clinton are running a pornography ring out of a basement of a pizzeria near DuPont Circle and cases are going up. In a context like that, the most spick and span and well-run transit system can't make up for those societal disadvantages. So, or disadvantages in the public health system writ large. You have to see a public transit system as part of that public infrastructure that includes the public health system. So the real story about Taiwan is not this train necessarily. This train 
actually exists in a context where cases were, were contained society-wide and then started to decline. So understanding where your city is on this chart in terms of the pandemic really should dictate how the transit system is managed and it does dictate what those risks are. So we, even though we're transit center, we would not recommend that you go out and ride the transit system in Miami or in Phoenix today, given the societal conditions, the public health conditions in those places, if you don't have to go out and ride. But nor would we recommend that you go to a birthday party or to a restaurant or to the movies or to school, because those are the conditions prevailing. Those are, those are also risky activities at this point. But the difference between transit and those others, other things that are, that are more discretionary in terms of going to a, a birthday party, or that could be, in the worst case, delivered remotely, like school. The difference between those things and transit is that transit is essential. Transit is essential to the functioning of the city. And it is essential in physical form. There isn't a video version of it. It's essential because of it carries essential workers. And so while we can choose not to go to birthday parties or go to casinos or to go on river cruises or other sorts of discretionary things, there are some people in our society, many people in our society who do not have the choice to not go to work. Not everybody is as lucky as the folks who are on this right now in the comfort of our safety of our homes or offices and choosing to be here. So now we're getting to the real point. If we, the lesson of today is that, 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 that density is not the point. So what is the point? Well, these are the issues that we really want to see addressed by policymakers and that need to be addressed by our government officials. Since transit really is a matter of the functionality of our cities, it's also a matter of racial justice in terms of who rides transit and who operates transit, who is actually working on transit. Our, and so this dictates to us, in terms of our goals, in terms of our values, how we operate transit and for whom we operate it, and the standards by which the people who work on it get to operate, uh, th this is the really important part. So our research done early on in the pandemic shows in the pre-pandemic days, about 30 to 35% of transit riderships on a normal, on a normal day are in the professions known as essential workers. During the pandemic, of course, it goes from 30, 35% to about 100% of the riders. 2.8 million, million Americans every day, half, over half of them black or Hispanic, depend on transit to get to jobs in healthcare, in food supply, and in the other essential professions. These are people who are overly exposed to risks at work, they tend to live, and, and Jessica obviously is going to get into the histor uh, current historic and current segregation of our housing stock on racial lines. People tend, tend to live in neighborhoods with worse health conditions and worse access to health care. They're less likely to have insurance or paid time off. Those are the people who are on transit during the pandemic, and transit agencies need to serve them. One of the ways they do that is through reallocating services. We've talked about in this blog, which is on our site, about how San Francisco did it. Reallocating service, Boston, along with San Francisco, very good at this. Changing the schedules, changing the geographic coverage of routes, really being responsive to where the essential workers live and where they work, where they need to get to go. Backdoor boarding to avoid passengers having to deal with the drivers and each other in the exchange of cash. cash. Provision of masks and sanitizers. The system in Portland, Oregon was one of the first to do that. Managing the ventilation and flow on the vehicles themselves in terms of the airflow. Now the workers themselves, transit workers themselves, are essential. They're essential because they carry the essential workers and taking care of them and listening to their needs is incredibly important. The needs for personal protective equipment, the need to change working conditions in terms of the check-in area, the dispatcher in the garages, provision of self of sick leave and quarantine provisions in case of any uh, symptoms or the hint of symptoms or exposure so that the workforce can be kept as safe as possible and just generally improving the labor management relationships, which quite frankly in the transit industry are very rigid and often very adversarial 
on, on, on both sides and really have inhibited change in many different ways. Well, this is a point in, which, in history when change needs to happen really fast, lives are at stake. And so that relationship between labor leaders and managers really needs to be much closer and much more adaptive, all of those things. With the workforce, it's also a matter of racial justice. When you look at the demographics, again, and this is, this is again our, our research, which is available on the site, which I'll, I'll cite, I'll, I'll give you this, the URL for that in a minute, but 47% of frontline transit workers, by which we mean operator, bus drivers, conductors, the ticket booth operators, 47% non-white, 62% are over the age of 45. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of comorbidity risk there as, as well. So those are the things that we think are important. We've been distracted by a debate about density when we've overlooked these more important issues about race and about relationships between workers and management and about who gets served and who doesn't. So as the pandemic eases, then as some of the restrictions come down, transit actually stacks up fairly well compared to certain other activities. Personally, I would rather spend 20 minutes on a bus with 50 people, if there are 50 people on a bus, I'd rather spend 20 minutes with them if we're all wearing masks and we're not talking and the vents are open and the door is opening every couple of blocks as they open, people get on and off. I'd rather do that than spend, see the same 50 people for two hours uh, in a restaurant eating and drinking and with waiters circulating around and maybe no windows that open and maybe only one door. So it's all a matter of sort of managing those risks with some of the things that I talked about and listening to the experts. And finally, that's the, the final point from us. And again, a lot of this, we're citing other people's research and a John, Johns Hopkins study recently showed that they did not correlate infection spread to transit. And again, the real point is the strongest correlation between COVID spread was with race, age, other demographic factors, including the medical history, and access to healthcare infrastructure in the person's neighborhood. So those are the things that our society ought to be working on. Those are the real issues that we think deserve attention. And that's where we're, we're asking policymakers to, to focus. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica Katz now from CHPC and look forward to hearing the details of their report. And then we will hear from Wayne and then we'll have some discussion, including audience questions. There is a Q&A icon down at the bottom of your screen. And so make use of that to, to load written questions in and we'll get to those later. Thank you, Jessica, welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Jessica Katz. I'm the executive director of the Citizens Housing and Planning Council. We are a New York City based think tank that does work on housing and planning issues. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what is the, the myths and facts around density. Um, first, I'm going to run through some of our other projects and just do a pitch for what CHPC does. We have some work that we're doing on basement apartment conversions. Um, one of those things that we realize might be even more useful in a post-COVID housing policy landscape. We have a project around uh, public housing, particularly in the UK, and how the UK's transformation of their public housing stock has could be could inform what we do here in the US and here in New York City in particular. And then New Lens for New York City's housing plan, which is our proposals for what the next housing plan should look like. A notable one here is housing housing plan for racial equity, housing plan for a city of immigrants, and a prescription for housing. So all these other ways that you could look at a housing plan beyond just counting units that would create a new set of policy tools and a new set of perspectives and constituencies for a housing plan beyond just a certain number of units. And then of course we have a global pandemic on our hands which has changed our view on what housing policy should be and also reminded us of some of the important things that were critical all along that we've been neglecting here in New York City. So one of the major housing policies post COVID is to really stop blaming density. So as David said, it sounds right, you know, transmission is about people, more people, more problems. Um, there's only one problem. Well, there's three problems. It's not true because the facts just don't bear it out, which we'll share. It's not fair. It kind of rehashes these hundred year old myths that are racist and xenophobic about cities being 
dirt full of sick and dirty other kind of people. So this is a very old saw that's being rehashed now and it's really dangerous to cities, but in particular, it's also not effective. It's really dangerous to use density as a distraction when in fact that misdiagnosis is gonna make us create bad housing policies and bad other kind of policies to respond to it, both in terms of our public health interventions and in terms of our economic recovery. So, you know, four months ago, you heard people talking about how we don't wanna to have to play by New York City's rules. We shouldn't have to play by New York rules. And now you see that there's this massive spread all across the country because people bought into this myth. So it's pretty dangerous. So not only is urban density not associated with COVID, it actually has a lot of benefits in a global pandemic. It's very harmful to our recovery. Um, and if we blame it, then it means we don't understand what the real risk factors are. Um, in, in this presentation, we're going to use housing density to mean people per square foot, but for a wonderfully uh, more nuanced and housing nerds dream look at what uh, other ways to look at housing density, I would check out the Skyscraper Museum, who before the pandemic had this amazing de uh, exhibition on housing density, so go ahead and check that out. So here's some analysis that we did. We took a look at New York City as compared to other global cities. We took a look at, at cities versus rural areas in the US. We took a look at New York versus the surrounding suburbs. And then we also looked at zip codes within New York City neighborhoods. So we tried to compare it any which way we could across the United States, around within, within the boroughs and suburbs versus cities. So we took our data as of May 18th, but it looks like that, that those distinctions would only be more stark with the data that follows. So any way you slice it, density is not a factor. Other dense global cities have seen many fewer cases. There are rural counties that have horrible case rates per capita compared to what New York City saw. Suburban counties around New York have more cases per capita than the five boroughs itself. And then within New York City, population density and COVID rates look almost opposite to each other. So any way we measure population density, anything we compare to, um, it shows that density is not a key driver of the impacts of COVID-19. So let's dig a little deeper. So other um, rural areas and global cities, Seoul is about 1.5 times as dense in terms of population than New York City, but New York City has 343 more cases per capita than Seoul. So density um, didn't, what didn't cause damage in Seoul and was not, the, was not to blame here. Um, in Trousdale County, Tennessee, which if you look on Google Maps is exactly what you're picturing, um, one in seven residents of Trousdale has COVID-19 versus at, on the date that we ran this data, one in 44 New Yorkers. That's due to an outbreak in a prison in Trousdale. Brooklyn is 20 times as dense as Rockin County, uh, but Rockin County has twice the COVID rate as Brooklyn. And then Manhattan is by far the densest of the five boroughs and yet has the lowest rate of COVID-19. Now that's true even if 15, 20, 30 percent of people in Manhattan have fled and that's why they didn't get it. That still it still is by far the densest and it still has the lowest rate. So even if you account for a very generously inflated idea of how many people left Manhattan versus the outer boroughs, that continues to be true. Um, and then within the five boroughs, population density and COVID rates are very misaligned. So Upper East Side has five times the population density as Elmhurst and Corona, and Elmhurst and Corona's case rate is much, much higher. The Bronx has 400% the density of Staten Island, but the uh, case rate is about the same. So it's a very, you, you can't compare. So ultimately, our message is you have to stop blaming density. The urban density provides for many, many benefits in a global pandemic. You have access to services and amenities within walking distance or without leaving home. All of us learned that um, while we were on lockdown in March and April and May. There's a decreased risk of isolation and vulnerable residents, or there could be if you put the proper procedures in place in the right communities. And there's a concentration of medical and healthcare talent and resources. And conversely, using density as a scapegoat is really, really harmful. So it creates this unfounded fear of living in cities. That's just not true. I'm sure all of you um, New Yorkers have got calls from your family members, those of us who stayed in town. Um, the lack of infrastructure 
creates problems on a good day, but then also particularly during a pandemic, um, it was, we had a, we had in many ways a better infrastructure to overcome COVID. And the, it also reduces the focus on the real risk factors. So we've made virtually no changes to our housing policies to address substandard housing conditions, to address homelessness, to address um, overcrowding in our housing and our overcrowding in institutional settings because we can sort of blithely blame density for the problem. It also takes the responsibility and the onus off our leadership to do something about the fu a future pandemic because it suggests that New York City and big cities in general are somehow by definition, ill-suited to manage a pandemic and that we couldn't have done better. And of course, that kind of lack of preparedness is a huge risk factor. So um, that's our data. We can share the link to the paper itself, but we're so grateful to everybody for being here today and listening to our density conversation. Thank you. I wanna turn it over now to Wayne Ho from Chinese American Planning Council. Thanks for joining us, Wayne. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you, Jessica. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now uh, and let everyone uh, see my presentation. So um, let me start my... So um, to give everyone an update, uh, once again, Wayne Ho, I'm the president and CEO of the Chinese American Planning Council, uh, CPC. We are the nation's only, or sorry, the nation's largest uh, Asian American social services provider. We are 55 years old and we serve over 60,000 New Yorkers uh, throughout uh, New York uh, City. And these 60,000 individuals range from uh, children to seniors, um, as well as uh, we serve everyone throughout the five boroughs through 50 programs across 35 locations. Um, at the end of our uh, theory of change is that we want to empower New Yorkers to be positive agents of change. So in terms of some on the ground, as David and Jessica said, I would discuss, uh, the Asian American community is the fastest growing group in New York City. Uh, we currently make up 15% of New York City and 10% of the state. This makes up about 40 ethnic groups uh, ranging in uh, even more languages and dialects. As you can see in the data here uh, from the Asian American Federation uh, that uh, poverty is high amongst the Asian American community. So while there's this uh, belief that the Asian American community are all doing well, what we call the model minority stereotype, the reality is that Asian Americans have a high rate of poverty. Um, when you look at the data from the census and the American Community Survey, it, that bears out. But more importantly, uh, New York City itself uh, came up with its own poverty measure a few years ago under the Bloomberg administration and it showed that Asian Americans actually, based on this new poverty measure, were the most poor group. Um, and then two years ago, when, uh, sorry, four years ago, uh, under the de Blasio administration, when new data came out, Asian Americans are now the second poorest group behind uh, Latinx populations. So in terms of COVID, everyone's heard about the challenges uh, faced during uh, the pandemic. But I think some things I wanna point out is that uh, because of bias, where we had a president that continued to say that uh, this is the Kung flu or the Chinese virus, that the challenges that the Asian American community faced already started going back to early January. So whereas the shelter in place happened in New York in mid-March, for the Asian American community, it started back in early January. So um, that's where data already came out that 50% uh, of Chinatown businesses were struggling back during January. We had um, information that folks were losing their jobs at a higher rate. And uh, to put it simply, the challenges that our community faced went two months before other communities. So this gets to the issue about structural racism, housing availability, and um, 
other uh, important structural factors that we gotta keep in mind in terms of how we address not just the relief efforts in the pandemic, but also the recovery efforts. So uh, it's important to note that while this pandemic was going on, we have a community that's over 70% immigrant. Uh, we also had other legislation going on from a xenophobic presidential administration where, for example, public charge, where if you try to access public benefits, specifically uh, housing vouchers, SNAP benefits for food uh, or uh, Medicaid, uh, your opportunity to join or to become a citizen would make it harder. So it actually disincentivized Asian American and immigrant communities to access resources. So just to give a quick stat, um, we know that when the federal stimulus package came through and unemployment benefits were increased and they added that $600 per week, the uh, amount the rates of Asian Americans who access unemployment went up 6,900%, nearly 7,000%. That was by far the highest for any racial group. So to compound the issues, there was anti-Asian harassment and hate crimes. So uh, we know working with uh, the city agencies, and I'm gonna acknowledge the different mayoral offices and as well as elected officials, um, there were more complaints about Asian American hate crimes. Uh, I had staff, colleagues, friends who had people yell at them on the streets, spit on them, throw things at them, get into physical altercations, uh, where things started out uh, with comments about someone sneezing in January or February and people making comments about them having coronavirus or walking away from them. Uh, we know this turned into uh, more bias and harassment um, as time went on. Uh, and so that's where, once again, in addition to people not coming to Chinatowns or to Asian American businesses, there was also physical altercations that happened and uh, challenged the safety of individuals, not just the public health safety, but their physical safety. So how do we respond? And I think this speaks to what Jessica was referring to about in uh, dense communities in cities and urban centers, there are a lot of resources out there. So communities responded because we know there's high food insecurity seniors who were more at risk, uh, everyone, a lot of people got together. So neighborhoods got together and businesses were struggling, restaurants were struggling, but we raised private dollars in order to support the restaurants and the restaurant workers. We got volunteers to go out and deliver food to individuals and we had to make sure it was culturally competent food. Uh, the emergency food program the city started while it was very big, it was not able to uh, meet the cultural needs of not just Asian American communities, but we also know there are challenges around halal meals, kosher meals, and other meals. Uh, and that's where the communities got together in order to make sure that we could all support each other. Um, and this relied on business leaders, neighborhood leaders, civic leaders, elected officials, as well as private donors and the nonprofit community we got together. And that's because we have those resources in a city like New York City. Uh, David spoke about essential services and essential workers, uh, and rightfully so, while we were recognizing healthcare professionals and nurses, as well as restaurant workers, deliverers, and grocers, uh, on behalf of the nonprofit community, we always wanted to remind people that human, human services workers are also essential workers. For CPC alone, uh, when things when shelter in place started, we were still providing our Meals on Wheels programming. We are still providing our home health care. We were still providing our early childhood centers for workers of us, uh, children of essential workers. Uh, we were still providing our residential programs. So we have senior affordable housing. We have affordable housing. Uh, we have a group home for individuals with disabilities. We were continuing to provide those services and we did it in a safe way be due to our COVID response, having the proper cleaning, having the proper PPEs. And that's where, as we start thinking about recovery on behalf of the nonprofit field, we want to make sure that low income communities, immigrant communities, human services workers who are highly underpaid, but come from black and brown and immigrant communities and Asian communities, that we are also top of mind. So uh, what happens if the subway system doesn't operate for 24 hours? We need to make sure we can get people around to provide these services. But there are also a lot of challenges that came up. Um, as I mentioned, food insecurity persists. 
with a highly immigrant population and with public charge, individuals did not want to take advantage of SNAP benefits. Uh, we also know, once again, that we need culturally competent meals for our community members. Um, while uh, the state and the city uh, said that certain human services workers were essential, unfortunately, at the beginning of the pandemic, the state and the city instructed us that we are on our own to find PPE, that we are on our own to find transportation options, that we are on our own to keep our staff safe and our clients safe. Uh, we are able to do that through the generosity of donors by buying PPE. Uh, Lyft and Uber credits came through so we can have everyone travel that way, as well as people were traveling by public transportation and doing so safely because we educated them the proper ways to manage that. Um, also, I'm sure you've all seen the work around eviction moratoriums, uh, the efforts to cancel rent, as well as making sure there's housing vouchers. Um, if we're calling for these policy changes to keep people in their homes, this means basically we're keeping people in New York City. And that's where it's great that we've seen some relief efforts and there's been private efforts to educate the community. Uh, but that's where we also need to recognize that more rent relief uh, is out there. Um, unfortunately, uh, the emergency rent relief program has not been implemented as well. And we know there continues to be some translation and interpretation issues and nonprofits continue to be on the ground to educate individuals. So um, while there's been these talks about density, uh, based on the research that we see, the Chinese American Planning Council, our development partners, Gotham Organization, we are moving through with our development project. We've had individuals ask us if we're changing our project, uh, which is going to have community facility, local retail, affordable housing, as well as market rate housing, uh, and it's 488 units in the Lower East Side. We already got land use approval for this before. Uh, the shelter in place, but we're moving forward with this. Uh, we're making some modifications to make sure that uh, there is on-site safety uh, based on everything that David and Jessica just said. But I think the key is we are not backing away from having this development because we know it's important to have more affordable housing in the neighborhoods that need it for the communities and the individuals and families across generations who need it. Uh, so Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about what's happening on the ground as well as some of the solutions we're looking at. And I will toss it back to David. Well, thanks very much, Jessica and Wayne. That's, that's really, I've learned a lot and that's always a good day if I learn stuff. Um, I've got a question as a non-housing person, sort of about terminology. When you talk about, can you be more precise in defining density? I mean, is it, is it you know, units per acre? Is it people per acre? And, and you've also, you're using the word crowding or overcrowding. And so could you go deeper into sort of how housing people define terms like density and overcrowding, what the difference of them is, between them is? Sure, and this is a really important point. And it was a, nerdy technical matter until people started throwing the word density around to blame for a massive global pandemic. So we use the term density to mean population density, which means per people per acre. Crowding we use to mean people per apartment. So those two things sound like they'd be related to each other. Again, there's sort of some conventional wisdom that says they must be kind of the same thing or, or related. They don't have to be, they're not. So for example, Wayne just told you about his project on the Lower East Side. There's a couple hundred seniors living in that building. That is going to be a high density, low crowding development. Conversely, there are some terrible outbreaks we're seeing um, on reservations um, out on the Western part of this country. Um, and in those reservations, you have very low population density, but very high crowding. So those two things have to be picked apart if we're gonna get this right. Got it. Wayne, did you want to amplify on that point? Um, yeah, I would just point out that the, the comparison that Jessica made is very important. Um, our own board members, our own supporters of our project on the Lower East Side have asked us specifically as we've been going through the design process, have been asking us, well, now that we're in a pandemic, are you going to make the senior units bigger? Are you going to make the lobby bigger? Are you going to uh, get rid of common spaces? And our response has been no. And we've been talking to obviously health professionals, looking at the guidance, looking at the research. But I think the takeaway for us is uh, 
we know that there needs to be more affordable housing, uh, but we know there's other practices that are important. Um, everything from not just our cleaning protocols to uh, what happens uh, in congregate spaces. But I think the big takeaway for us is that there's other ways to keep people safe. And we know there's a need for more affordable housing in the community. So I think that the differences that Jessica just brought up about density and crowding, I think is the key talking point for people to keep in mind as they walk away from this webinar. Right, and further, it, this is the key place where the misdiagnosis really messes up the treatment, right? So if you think density is the problem, then the answer is less housing because you'll have less people and less transmission. But if you know that density is not the problem and crowding is the problem, now you know you need more housing, not less. So if we, if we keep tying ourselves to this density or misunderstand what that word means, then we're really going to miss an opportunity to solve this problem for the next time. Do we lose David due to the storm? I hope not. This is Kapish and uh, David has just told me that he has lost power. Great. So Jessica and I will talk to each other. Um, I think just one quick note uh, on just some statistics to keep in mind is that uh, the Asian American community, I forgot to note, it actually has, lives in the most overcrowded housing of any community. And that's where uh, any efforts to ensure that there's affordable housing and that's where a CHPC and looking at what's a housing plan for immigrants, a housing plan for racial equity, and a housing plan for other marginalized communities becomes very important because when you have two, three, four families across generations living in a household, overcrowding becomes the issue, not necessarily density. Uh, so I think that's where uh, keeping in mind the separation becomes very important and why we do need more affordable housing stock. Right, and I think there's a real risk that we um, kind of wed ourselves to this, I don't know, someone called it hygiene theater in the newspaper the other day, that we sort of focus on things that make us feel like we're solving the problem versus things that are actually gonna solve the problem. And while we see all this hygiene theater going on all over around us, we're not seeing anyone answer the question of how to create housing supply to address overcrowding. Um, and then further, I'll say, as since we wrote this paper in late May, and since that's happened, there's been multiple other outlets that have covered this in the press and other places that have um, redone this data in various ways, all of which have led to the same thing. So even while the evidence builds and builds, the density is not the problem, the sort of casual use and casual indictment of density I think seems to persist. So the same media outlet that will publish an article about how the American Planning Association worries that in fact sprawl may be contributing to COVID-19, the next day we'll publish an article that says, you know, well, density and all these other factors, and they'll just sort of say it in passing in this casual way that is really problematic. And I'm sure, you know, those of you who are living in big cities right now have heard this from your um, friends and family <laughs> about how nervous people are about cities right now. So, you know, I say this as a booster of New York City and cities in particular, but also really worrying that not taking the advice, um, like, you know, misdiagnosing this problem for New York City has really caused a lot of damage and frankly deaths around the country. So it's made people feel like housing supply is a problem and not a feature. It's made people worry that compliance is not as important. It's made people feel safer in places with less people, even if people are not complying with social distancing and masking. So I think these things have been, these, it's, it's not just that it's gonna cause a problem for New York, it's really starting to cause problems all across the country. So Jessica, uh, I was looking at, while you were speaking, I was looking at the Q&A and there's a question on here about, is there data on COVID infection rates relative to quality of housing? And they're specifically talking about, as an example, NYCHA properties compared to HPD funded new construction or buildings with mechanical ventilation versus window AC units. I was wondering if you had any experience with that. Yes, we don't have that data yet. We have been trying to see whether the test and trace process can be part of a solution to that. Um, the, but that data for the most part is not available. The HIPAA regulations make that pretty difficult. But at some point, someone who has access to that data is going to have to really take a look to see ventilation, overcrowding, subsidies, things like that. Um, I think those are going to be the really important next set of questions. 
Yeah, and then um, I, we know too that uh, during this time, the state and the city have talked about the budget deficits that they're in. And uh, as an example, um, you know, $10 billion deficit for the city, I believe, $9 billion for the state, and this is a couple months ago. Uh, so we heard that the HPD budget was cut by 40%, I think, for subsidies for affordable housing. So what's your take, Jessica, from the budget cut for affordable housing and how that's going to impact uh, the pandemic and the recovery aspect? I mean, it was so deeply counterproductive. It's counterproductive on the economics. Affordable housing has always been on the forefront of our economic recovery from all prior disasters, even the, you know, four or five that I've had the misfortune of living through here in New York City and going back even further. And it also is just, you know, it was, it, it's, it's, a, it's a both a public health and, a, and an economic problem. So I think that was a misguided decision. Um, there's a question in the chat also around prisons. So a lot of those big rural outbreaks were as a result of prison. So again, there's a big difference. That's another example of the difference between crowding versus um, population density. So a large prison in a rural area creates a low density, high crowding situation. And that at some point that was five out of 10 of the country's largest outbreaks. Now it's eight out of 10. So every couple of days you see an article about the proportion of our COVID issues across the country that's due to prisons. And then of course here in New York, we had this tremendous tragedy in the nursing homes, which is also um, something that definitely warrants further a closer look, I would say. Yeah, and I, I think if we look at all the demographics too, uh, about the importance of housing and marginalized communities, all the demographics say that uh, seniors are the fastest growing population uh, by age in New York City. And then we know Asian Americans and immigrants are a fast growing group in New York City. So put those two together, we know that uh, immigrant uh, older adults are going to, are growing quickly and they're gonna need more housing. Um, and if the pandemic continues and there's not as many senior centers or social adult day centers, or if they can't go out as often, uh, then that's where we know that uh, we are going to need more denser, denser developments, but we need to make sure we're reducing overcrowding in those uh, in the housing. Uh, related to that, I don't know, if Jessica, if you have enough experience, I think this is where David is going to come in. But there's some questions on here about uh, analogous from the density versus crowding argument and how or comparison and how this plays out in transit and the subways. And does that mean we actually need more, I believe, more subway lines, more bus lines, too, if you have any experience from that? Um, you know, this is really David's area of expertise, but I'll say from the transit center's research, the, that's where the social distancing requirements really come into play. So with masking, with uh, mask compliance and no talking, there seems to have really, they've, they've really dodged a bullet and there have not been, even in countries that have very, very robust test and trace systems, um, they have not been able to trace outbreaks to transit. So, you know, here, here you could say, well, we don't really know where the outbreaks are coming from because we have not done test and trace properly. But in, in these other countries, they really know where people are getting sick and they have not been able to trace them back to transit. And then is that David who's uh, back with us on the 503? Well, I don't, I don't yeah, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm David, can you hear me? Yep, we yeah. can hear you, David. I, oh, hey, hi everybody. Sorry about that, the electricity's out. Um, yeah, I think that you got that right. You were under pressure there, but you, you answered the transit question. Maybe we should trade jobs. But um, yeah, there does become a point where, you know, the thing also about transit use is that it's not an act. It's not the sole activity that somebody does. So when you're at the point of sort of community spread and tracing that, you know, somebody who's been on transit has most likely also been in other environments and um, you know, they've been at the office, they've been shopping and they've been doing the other things. So, um, it, you know, that, that, that's part of the issue. Yeah. Um, there's a question on here too about what kind of models were used and what was the sample sizes. Um, we actually didn't need to have a sample size because we have the data on all of the COVID cases and all of the deaths by zip code. So we just use the population data from the census, which is obviously somewhat of a sample to get population um, by zip code and by community board. And then we also had all the cases and all the deaths um, also by borough and by zip code. So we have we have a pretty complete data set. We didn't really need to use a sample. Um, you know, the 
So we didn't, we didn't need to rely on test and trace to know perfectly where everyone has been in order to do this research. Uh, I have another, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Wayne. Um, I can't get the visual cues, but you, you go ahead and then I've got an, another question for no, you. No, go, go ahead, David, go ahead, David, ask your question. Um, so, you know, I wondered how you're both sort of getting these points across to policymakers and to journalists. And in particular, sort of what are the lessons that we can draw that are durable beyond the pandemic itself? I mean, there are things that we're doing differently now that maybe are things we should have been doing all along, regardless of, of the pandemic. So I thought you could talk about some of those policies. I, and needless to say, I have some ideas about that from the transit realm when, uh, after you're done. Go ahead, Jessica. Sure. So, you know, I think that the the data is getting to the point where I think the policymakers are no longer hitting density as hard as they were early in the pandemic. So that's a good thing. Um, but in some ways, the damage is done, right? So now it's just sort of casually mentioned in the newspaper, and then I think you'll hear you'll hear your friends who are debating whether to leave New York City or are wondering why we still live in New York City. Say, well, you know, just all those people. So I think one thing, there's a few hundred people here on this call. I think one thing I would really ask you guys is to really challenge that when you hear it. So I wanna, someone the other day posted our report on um, one of the mama's Facebook groups. So, you know, send that to your friends who think it's crazy you still live in New York, post it on the mommy blogs when you see people saying, is it safe to raise kids in New York City? Tell people, you know, things are going great in Taipei when they say, oh, you're taking the subway, that's crazy. So I think this is really going to be a like person to person, uh, you know, one to one trust based communication. So we really need everyone in this call to help spread the word about this. And I think once again, we have to think about the structural aspects that we're talking about. So we know that uh, certain communities uh, who had to work throughout the pandemic and once again, whether we call them essential workers or not, um, a lot of those were not just the healthcare professionals, but we had um, uh, marginalized communities who are working in sectors not earning as much and less uh, healthcare access and less resources were continuing to work. And I would argue that included not just deliverers and other and restaurant workers and food deliverers and others that we've been talking about or grocers, uh, but that does also include a lot of uh, human services nonprofit workers who continue to go out there. Uh, the vast majority of human services nonprofit staff in New York City are paid through government contracts, the city, state, federal contracts, and they're the ones that dictate our salary structure and our salary levels. Uh, and we were uh, contractually obligated to continue providing these services. So there's plenty of data out there about 80% of nonprofit human services workers are black and brown, mostly women, mostly immigrant. And that's where their um, safety was also at risk. And that's where we made sure that we tried to provide PPE, provide, uh, educate them on the best practices, stay up to date on healthcare policy and healthcare research around the uh, pandemic. So I think that's something we also need to educate uh, policymakers about and have continued to do so, which is that you've been talking about essential workers, but let's really think about how human services workers are not only key for the relief efforts that have been going on during the pandemic, but during the recovery itself, we need to think about them. And I think that's where Jessica brought up on, are we gonna have more affordable housing for all essential workers, including human services workers? Are we gonna make sure that there's proper transit uh, for these workers? Are we gonna make sure uh, that there's the proper uh, health insurance and employment practices and employer policies to support the workers. And I think that's a larger conversation that we need in order to keep everyone safe in a high density area like New York City. Right, I think yeah. when, you, when you hear indictment of the city's housing policies, one thing that um, you know, housers like myself get a little anxious, you hear people say, well, affordable for who? Um, but then you know, the, more, the more you sit with that, um, it's like, yeah, affordable for who? We don't, do we, 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 we run affordable housing through a housing lottery. We don't target it towards particular sectors or particular values or particular neighborhoods. So for example, uh, the home health aides that we needed to keep showing up to work, the grocery store stockers, they have the longest commutes, they have the most difficult housing costs, they're more likely to live in overcrowded intergenerational families. So we put them at risk multiple times over. 
Um, and then our housing plan says, you know, apply to the lottery, you've got a one in a million shot. We have abandoned completely the basement apartment conversions program that would have helped exactly the neighborhoods and the populations, the black homeowners, the multi-generational immigrant families, the neighborhoods that were the hardest hit to make their housing stock safer and better and make the families more financially stable at exactly the moment that we need it the most. Um, and we've sort of avoided making the regulatory changes that we need to make our housing supply system more equitable and more robust for the people that need it the most. And David, there's a question in the chat box, or several questions around how do you keep transit safe? Uh, when the winter months come, people are gonna take more public transportation. Uh, what's the ventilation on the subway system? How do we deal with crowding versus density? Uh, do you wanna take some of those questions? Sure, let me, let me try to take those. But first I wanna ask, ask, answer my own question that you just answered in terms of you know, recent lessons. And I think, I think I'd say similar things about transit as you said about housing in the sense that transit in the United States, public transit in the US was really, really substandard before the pandemic. And the pandemic exposed just how, how substandard. And some of the things that we're improvising in the pandemic are actually good lessons that should have been done anyway and need to be built upon uh, going forward. And the, the ones that I would name, and these are, these are all like, these have been sort of core to our work for many years. Uh, we just didn't necessarily know just how it would be deployed. But, you know, first and foremost is responsiveness to riders and putting the service where the people who use it the most are. And being responsive to riders also means having riders in the governance structures in the decision making process. And when you look for example, a lack of representation, lack of diversity on most transit boards in this country, including New York, which itself is a very diverse city, and the MTA board until fairly recently has, has you know, it's still not representative, but um, is, I think, perhaps moving in the right direction slightly. But that sort of responsiveness to riders and accountability to the public has really is one of the reasons that transit is not very functional in this country. And so improving on that, I think in the, in the nature of sort of reallocating service during this emergency should be, so should be, we have similar principles that can be applied toward more longer term sort of network redesigns. I think there are operating practices like the Backdoor boarding, which are pressed, were pressed into service in most places in the last three months. Uh, all door boarding, it speeds the buses up. It's it's better for the customer to get people on and off faster. So even even if uh, you know even if you weren't worried about the infection risk, the interaction between the driver and the passenger, all door boarding makes a lot of sense. It should be you know should be continued. And then the the nature of labor management relationships and the the adaptability that some some systems have shown toward in terms of deploying and work rules, um, you know, that, that, if that sort of spirit could continue that the industry might be quite not as, as rigid. So uh, we're bumping up against time. So I, I, you know, in terms of the other technical question, I just want to refer people to our website, transitcenter.org, or if you have questions, you can also write to events at transitcenter.org. And there's a bunch of technical information on our site there with regard to personal protective equipment, what different AO we're celebrating and highlighting what some agencies are doing around the country. Um, so more information there. I'm going to turn to, to, to Jessica in a minute for a final word here. But I want to first thank you, Wayne, for, for joining us and for all the work that you do. You mentioned your uh, organization's 55 years old. You did not, you were too modest to mention that you just got named one of the 40 under 40. So you're not 55 yourself, you're under 40 because you qualified. I think it's City and State Magazine, right? They named you one of the 40 most influential people under the age of 40. So get that little bio in, plug in there. Um, so just in summary from us at Transit Center, again, great working with these partners in the housing field. You know, we really think that cities are where it's at. And when cities are just and sustainable, they are the product and the source of progress. They are not the problem that they were painted as in the early stages of this uh, ep epidemic pandemic. And, you know, when cities are diverse and there's prosperity and opportunity that are fairly shared, God, you know, they're real economic dynamos. They are certain the benefits of density are clear, 
more efficient transportation, cleaner air, reduced energy consumption. Remember, per capita greenhouse gas emissions attributed to New York City, way below the national average. It's, uh, city, cities are great places, and we should make them as good as they can be, rather than demonize them the way that's been going on. So, Jessica, final word to you. One of the constitutional functions of the federal government that the current regime is sort of observing this constitutional nicety is something that happens every 10 years. Why don't you take us out by giving us a final statement about that federal function? Thanks, everybody. There's several hundred people on this call. I want every single one of you to fill out your census. I don't want you in my Zoom room if you haven't filled out your census, and you definitely don't get a mask if you don't fill it out. So the link is on the screen right now. Please go fill out your census form. It's the most important act of democracy you can do. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, and goodbye. Thank Bye. you.